Hi everybody, um, today we are going to review uh, Gordon Allport's theory of personality. I know we're going back a few weeks, um, but it's important to review before you hand in your final. Um, I know you have your class notes and the videos and your textbook, um, but I just wanted to touch base with you guys. Um, I did read all of your forums, so I know you have a pretty good working knowledge of um, Allport's theory. Um, the thing about Allport is he's a bit different than some of the other theorists that we have discussed this semester. Um, he was what we call very eclectic, meaning that um, he took the best from a wide variety of different um, theories of personality. Um, he believes strongly that the principles that govern uh, the behavior of non-human animals, meaning, you know, not us, but the rest of nature, um, or neurotic humans are different from those, from the behavior that governs healthy adults. Um, he talked a lot about neurosis, um, and what he said was that, you know, you have to think forward instead of going backward when you are constantly worrying about what happened in the past or doing the shoulda, coulda, woulda, kind of like Karen Horney's tyranny of the shoulds. Um, you're not really going to be able to grow as a person and you're going to become somewhat stagnant. Um, he really was not into studying animals um, or behaviorism. Uh, he basically felt that a lot of the theories that you've discussed so far um, took away from or obscured um, human individuality and dignity. Uh, he did not like the idea of putting people into categories and labels. Um, and he believed in the importance of the individual, the importance of the self. Now, this is somewhat similar to Maslow and Rogers, which we'll get to later on in this series, um, but he distrusted science as a source of information. So um, he basically took everything that the behaviorists were saying and just threw it right out the window. Um, he basically said that if a person wants to change their behavior, they'll do it. Um, what's important is trying to figure out what will motivate them to change that behavior. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I, I, I do think that your own self-motivation has quite a bit to do with whether or not you break out of bad habits or, um, you know, decide to address your mental health issues. Um, and there's a quote that I think pretty much sums up what it is that he's trying to say. And I think it's in your notes also. Um, he says that personality is the dynamic organization within the, within the individual of those phys psychophysical systems that determine his unique adjustments to the environment. What does that mean? Um, everybody adjusts to things in different ways. And um, life is really just about adjusting to whatever it is that is going on. And he said, our personality is um, the way that we organize those experiences and we adjust to change. So um, throughout this semester, you know, we've been on a, a roller coaster ride, um, not just with classes, but just with life. And, um, you know, Allport would say that this is a really good time for you to be doing some self-reflection and um, deciding if there are any negative behaviors in your life that you need to kind of address. Um, taking stock, really, really important. Um, he said that personality is never something that is, rather it's something that is becoming, which means that we're constantly um, evolving and um, we definitely respond to certain simulations excuse me, we definitely respond to certain situations um, pretty much consistently in the fact that like, you know, someone who's introverted tends to be introverted. Someone who's extroverted tends to be extroverted. Um, but what he said was that each experience that we have basically um, helps to, to change us and helps us to tweak our um, personalities. And sometimes, you know, you might be an introvert, but in a certain situation, you might become 
extroverted. Um, and I can give you an example of this. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my best friend, she was very timid and I was kind of like the big mouth, huge surprise. I know surprise to you guys. And, uh, we were on the street one day, I don't know, you know, we were kids and, uh, this girl like ripped my headband off my head. And my best friend who is very introverted and normally would not, um, start a fight, just turn around to this girl. I was like, Hey, give me that headband back. And she ripped it right out of her hand, um, and handed it back to me. And I was like, Whoa. Um, and we've talked about it and she said, you know, normally I wouldn't do something like that, but I've never seen you freeze before. So she found the courage in herself to kind of stick up to the bully. Um, and that's what Allport says is that you learn through your experiences, what you're capable of doing and not capable of doing. And sometimes you can kind of like surprise yourself. Um, and I think that that is something that we've all experienced. Um, you know, you may have surprised yourself in a certain situation or have a friend who, you know, did something similar or a family member to what I just described. Um, and he also talked about our roar materials of personality. Um, those raw materials are our temperament, meaning how we respond to stress, how we respond to um, change, our intelligence, meaning our IQ, and our physical physique. He said that all three of these things are genetically determined and they help to shape our personality. Um, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> And I have mixed feelings about it, um, but I do think that these things are genetically determined to a certain extent because we have the science that backs it up. Um, and it, you know, all these theories that you're hearing about, you know, they're 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 controversial for a reason. Um, and it's it's hard to basically pigeonhole anybody into any one of these theories, which is why I like uh, Wellport because he's very eclectic. Um, and he says like, you know, what works for me may not work for you. Um, he said that a person's traits create a possible range of responses to a given situation. Um, but it's the nature of the situation itself that determines which of the potential behaviors actually occur. Um, this is why, you know, you may find yourself saying or doing something that you normally wouldn't. And what it's about is the environment that you're in. Um, and, you know, that brings us back to that nature nurture debate. Um, <clears throat> he also talked a lot about um, what he called the proprium, P R O P R I U M. Um, the proprium um, are all the facts about a person that make him or her unique, okay? Um, you know, not just your physical appearance, but what it is that you like to do, what it is that you're good at doing. Um, you know, some people are just naturally gifted in reading or mathematics or science. Um, and he said that that is part of what who you are and the experiences that you have in life um, shape your personality. Um, and, you know, the thing about it is, is like you and I could have the same exact experience at the same exact time and based on our personalities, interpret um, those experiences to be either negative or positive. Um, and all Port believe that to have full appropriate functioning, meaning that the proprium is functioning at its optimal level. Um we went through an eight state, we go through an eight stage, um, developmental sequence. Now Erickson talks about eight stages of development. Um, and Allport does also, but he breaks them down, um, a little bit differently. Um, he says that it starts until uh, he says that our development starts at birth and continues through adulthood. Now Erickson goes through the entire lifespan. Okay. Um, he says that, we start to become um, self-aware. And once we become self-aware, we slowly evolve over time. Um, and it starts with um, the first year, which is very similar to the other theories that you meant, uh, covered so far, excuse me. Um, and that's the sense of bodily me. That's in the first year. 
Um, and it's basically every year up until the age of six, okay, which goes along with Freud's latent stage, um, is that the baby and the small child are going through periods of sense of self-identity in the second year, sense of self-esteem in the third year, sense of self-extension in the fourth year, emergence of self-image between four and six, and then between six and 12, um, emergence of self as a, as a rational coper. And that goes along, like I said, with Freud's theory of latent development um, in the fact that he says that children recognize thinking as a means of solving life's problems. It's like, did you ever think about thinking? Think about that for a second. Did you ever think about the fact that we think? Um, this is where around the age of you know, between six and 12 kids start asking, get started asking critical thinking questions. Um, kids will say, wow, I wonder what I'm going to, why am I here? What am I doing? Um, they become very well aware of the fact that, you know, thinking helps them get out of trouble also, right? Problem solving. And if, if you think back to grammar school, what were they constantly doing? Teaching you critical thinking, teaching you, um, you know, mathematics and, reading and teaching you how to solve problems utilizing those skills. Um, and then from 12 years to adolescence, he talks about the emergence of appropriate striving. Okay. Um, and what that's about is people become future oriented, right? And there's some truth to that because think about it. When 12 to adolescence, which is what you're coming out of right now, what was it all about? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to start working? Um, you know, what are you going to do with your life? I'm sure you've had uh, adults say to you, so what are you going to do when you grow up? And you're like, I don't know. I didn't grow up yet. But then you hit adulthood. Okay. And he calls that the emergence of self as a knower. OK. Um, and what that is, is it's a he, he says all the appropriate functions start to synthesize together. Um, and this final stage of development occurs when the self is aware of itself, it unifies and transcends the preceding seven aspects of the self. So very much like Erickson and Freud, um, he talks about, you know, needing to resolve these stages and that if you don't resolve them that you'll basically quote unquote get stuck in those stages. Um, he says that our conscience, our moral conscience, guilt, the superego, if you want to use a Freudian term, um, al emerges along with several aspects of the program, especially our self esteem, a self image. Um, and we develop what's called a must conscience, meaning this is what's right and this is what's wrong. I must do this because this is the right thing to do. Um, moral reasoning, uh, uh, you know, and, and what's that based on? The fact that you're now an adult and you've learned the difference between right and wrong, not just from your parents and your teachers, but through your own life experience. Um, you know, normal morality in adulthood, okay, um, is varied. Okay. Why? Your religion, the way that you were brought up, your own personal feelings about things, your own experiences with things. Um, but what Walt Porter's saying is that if you have a healthy conscience, okay, um, you're rational, you're future oriented, um, you're worried about, you know, where you're going to be in six months, you're worried about where you're going to be a year from now. So people who struggle with anxiety and depression, that's really, really hard. Um, even right now, what we're going through, it's like, I, I have no idea what we're going to be doing in two or three months down here, um, you know, downstate, uh, where, you know, we're still battling the coronavirus. Um, I do know that eventually I'll be back in a classroom. I do know eventually that things may be different, but that we'll be out in the world again, and I will see your faces. Um and that's based on my life experience, having lived through September 11th, having, you know, grown up in the 80s and the 90s where there was quite a bit of turmoil. Um, and that's my personality. That's part of my proprium. Um, not everyone responds that way. Um, so 
to sum up, he basically says the healthy person is future oriented. Okay. The unhealthy person is one whose growth has been stifled. Um, and, um, by having their growth stifled, the motives of the unhealthy person are very different than the motives of, um, a healthy person. He talks about healthy and unhealthy all the time. Um, not that you should not reflect on your past, not that you should not, um, you know, look at where you've come from, think about your childhood, think about why you function the way that you do. But basically what he's saying is like, if you keep driving the car and you're turning backwards, what's going to end up happening? You're going to end up crashing into the wall and you're not going to be able to make any progress to help yourself. So, um, his theory is really interesting. And I had asked you in your forum to uh, look at the part of his theory where he studied prejudice. Okay. Um, and that's like a touchy topic for most of us. Um, but basically what he said was that as human beings, we do prejudge each other. Um, and you know, there's a certain truth to that. Think about it when you walk into class, the first day of class and you got to figure out where to sit, right? You look around and you look for someone who like, you kind of know, or maybe is the same gender or is dressed kind of like you, or, you know, you've seen around campus and you said hi to a few times. Um, you know, that's a prejudgment. Um, but what he looked at was, you know, why do people become prejudiced? Um, and what he said was that this is closely related to the natural tendency that human beings have to generalize from one experience to another. Um, he said another factor that facilitates the formation of negative prejudice is the tendency to form in groups. Um, and we all do that, you know? Um, so basically what he was saying is that prejudice is natural. Now, prejudice is not racism. Racism is believing that you are superior to another race because, you know, the color of your skin and you know what that is. But prejudice is basically um, prejudging, right? And this is a huge controversy in psychology because we do prejudge you when we read your psychosocial. So if you're interested in racism, if you're interested um, in prejudice, or you've ever been a victim of it yourself, which I'm sure you have, um, he's a very interesting theorist to kind of like veer off into that topic. Um, and I hope that this was a good overall review of his theory. Um, your forums were great and you should be prepping for your finals. So please email me with any questions or concerns and have a great day.